What the hell does this thing do anyway? That was for the guy who told me to stop with the coffee thing at the beginning. You're welcome. Now, today's video is gonna be a little bit different. I get asked often, what tools do I keep in my hand tool cabinet? And so today I thought it might be interesting, informative, and helpful for you all to see my collection of hand tools, what tools I break out on a regular basis for a project, what tools I keep in there, simply because I love them. Like I have a deep affection for them, even though I don't break them out all that often and where I see them fitting into my workflow as a furniture maker. It's kind of a shop tour on a miniature scale, if you will. Hi. Hi. What are you doing? Yes, I have a guest in the shop today. This is Huckleberry. He's chilling. He's chilling. But if you hear dog paws walking around or if you see somebody jump up and lick me, I figured I'd acknowledge his existence. Back to hand tools. So let's start with the cabinet itself. The cabinet I made when I was in the nine month program at the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship up in Maine. As part of the machine skills portion of the program, we all produced the same cabinet. We all used it as our tool cabinet while we were there. I've continued to use it as my tool cabinet to this day, mostly just because it reminds me of my days at CFC, which I'm immensely grateful for and proud of. Now, for some of the things on the interior of the cabinet, I figure I'll just go bottom to top. Before I do, I want to acknowledge that I'm not sponsored by any of the companies nor have I ever been sponsored by any of the companies that exist in this tool cabinet. I did work for Lee Nielsen for a number of years doing the hand tool events. So you'll see that I have some Lee Nielsen tools. I did get those at a discount as an employee of Lee Nielsen. However, I still paid for them with my own money and I still believe genuinely that they are some of the best hand tools on the market. Price notwithstanding, your preference notwithstanding for new versus old tools, Stanley versus Veritas versus Lee Nielsen. That's an entirely different debate. You'll see I have all three, but I did want to acknowledge that up front. So that said, first up, my number eight. I do love this thing. It's, it's, listen, it's not necessary. Not everybody needs a 24 inch jointing plane. That's fine, I get that. I'm not suggesting that you do. But man, do I love this plane. It's just, it's fun to use. It's 10 pounds on the money. It's massive. You can sling this thing around. Once this thing gets going through a cut, I can essentially just throw this thing and it's not going to stop due to grain differentials or knots in the piece. Like it is going to cut. There's no doubt about it. This is also the widest blade that Lee Nielsen makes. So it takes off a lot of material. It keeps things flat, which is the whole point of having a long plane like this. So. That's my number eight. I personally love this one. Is it necessary? No. Do I use it all the time? More than you'd think. The next shelf is really my measuring and marking shelf for the most part. I've got my 12 inch combination square and my four inch double square. I use both of these all the time. This is easily the most important measuring tool in the shop. My four inch double square. I love this one, guys. I use it all the time because this one's kind of big and bulky. This one, for some of the smaller work, brilliant. But these two squares, whether you get stared or not, these two sizes of squares I found to be universally advantageous when marking and measuring my work. On our third shelf, really all I've got up here is a selection of abrading and cutting tools. I've got two rasps from RU. These are my favorite rasps in the world. Now, RU is a French company. No disrespect to the French. I love them. I love many things about their culture. Their ability to continuously produce goods and wares. You know, these are very difficult to get at this point. When I bought them 10 years ago, they were a little bit more easy to get. These are all hand stitched, meaning that a person comes in here and stitches each one of these teeth by hand. If you can get your hands on some RUs, they're not cheap, but they are absolutely worth the investment. I've got an inexpensive little rat tail rasp, which is always good to have on hand. And I don't, I don't remember what these are called, but they are mini rasps, really, right? These are really nice for detail work. A riffler? I think it's a riffler. I think that's right. The aforementioned plow plane. Now, 
I love this plane. Do I break it out often? No. Do I keep it in there just because it's like, I, I just love it so much. It's so dumb and stupid. It's wonderful. So what this tool does is it creates a plow on say the bottom of a drawer. It's a brilliant little tool. I especially like this old record 43. The reason I have this wooden piece here is because this is an older plane and this fence is slightly out of parallel with the actual blade. So I created this tapered fence so that the fence and the blade are parallel. It's brilliant, I love it. Do you need one? No. Should you have one? Yeah, because it's fun to use. Here's another one I don't use often, but is nice to have on hand. This is really a shoulder plane, but while I don't use it often because I have other options for such work, this one in particular is nice. This is an old Stanley 93 because I can take this screw out and I can use it as a bullnose plane. So if I'm doing any interior work and I need to just clean up an interior corner where this section would be an issue or any toe on another plane would be an issue, I can pop that off and use it as a bullnose. Convenient. One of my favorite tools of all time, the router plane. This thing, guys, when I tell you that this thing can do anything outside of finishing a surface, outside of acting as a number four, this tool can do basically any bit of joinery you need it to do. And, and I'm not going to be a Veritas defender in many situations. I prefer Lee Nielsen for a wide array of reasons, which we won't get into in this video, but this, this might be the one tool from Lee Valley or Veritas that I do prefer over a Lee Nielsen. I just think it's a brilliant tool. You can do mortise and tenon joinery with this. You can do dados with this. You can do grooves with this. You can do rabbits with it. You can do any number of things that you need a flat, even bottom surface on here. You can do with this tool. If you are into hand tool woodworking at all, pick one of these up. Whether it's an old Stanley, whether it's a, a Lee Nielsen, whether it's a Veritas, doesn't matter, you will not regret buying this tool. An underrated tool right here, the cabinet scraper. Now what this is is essentially just a card scraper and a body so that it can act as a plane. You can keep a flat surface with this tool better than you can using a simple card scraper. This is one of those tools that is not a necessity, but if you're doing a lot of scraping or if you're working in a lot of highly figured woods that are prone to tear out with hand tools, this is a brilliant way to finish off like a large tabletop where you still want a nice flat even surface without a lot of indentations that are going to show up in the finish that you would get from say using a card scraper to remove a lot of tear out. I don't break it out often, but when I need it, it's really nice to have it. Now this tool is the reason I don't use that Stanley 93 quite a bit. This is a rabbiting block plane from Lee Nielsen. I don't use it often. I don't think this style body is very comfortable in the hand. I think this 62 based version, this is just the rabbiting version, is a little bit bulky for single handed use, which is how I like to use my block planes. However, when you need a rabbiting capability on a hand plane, I think these are more comfortable to use than say a shoulder plane. Now this plane, oh, this plane. I love this plane so much, it's so dumb. But there's a number of reasons I love this plane. Number one, this is from H&T Gordon, who's one of the finest plane makers on the planet in my opinion, at least on a larger production scale. This is made of brass and curly gidgey, which is a very dense, very difficult to work Australian wood. It's just a beautiful, beautiful plane. I've never seen a tool from H&T Gordon that is not just stunning. It's gorgeous. It functions really well. This bedding angle is at a higher angle. It's at 55 degrees because when you're working with super dense woods or highly figured woods like they often are in Australia, you want a higher bedding angle to reduce tear out. So that's why that's bedded at a little bit of a higher angle. This plane was also a gift from a former student. So it's one of those things that also holds a lot of sentimental value. So take that for what it is. It's a bit more pricey. Uh, but as a gift, it's just, it's one of my favorite tools in my arsenal. Now all the way up top, I've got nothing more than a couple of straps up here that can take these on job sites to make sure that I'm staying fresh and sharp and not getting any tear out. Yeah, I've got a Lee Nielsen dusting brush because I'm bougie and fancy and sometimes I like to feel like a good, good woodworking boy. And then this thing is really interesting. This is a, a compressed comb of coconut fibers that used to be used for burnishing shellac finishes. I've only used it a couple of times, but it's really interesting just to see different techniques from 
old timey woodworkers on how they get a really nice pristine finish. And this is one of those ways. They would apply the shellac and then they would rub this in small circles, similar to the way that you would get a French polish, but in a different part of the world. I don't remember where this came from. This was a gift from a friend of mine. I believe this is an East Asian technique. Don't quote me on that. I could be very, very wrong on that. However, I do believe that's accurate. The technique is still really interesting and that's what this is. On to the top, simple wooden mallet. Here's the truth, I never used this. I used to be a wood shop teacher. I taught grades five through 12 and so I came up with a mallet design, I made one, I have one. This is more of a token of my time teaching children about woodworking, which I deeply loved and enjoyed. I literally, I've never used it once. This, this is a scrub plane from Lee Nielsen. You can see by how dusty it is, I very rarely use it. I don't use this as a processing tool, though the original intent of a scrub plane was to remove a lot of material quickly when you're flattening and squaring up boards by hand. I use this as a texturing tool. I haven't used this specific texture in a while on a piece, but if you're going to be processing boards by hand, this is a really helpful tool to have, not necessary, but definitely makes life more efficient. I do, on occasion, break out a wooden plane. I like this one. This is one I picked up many, many years ago. This is an old beach plane. I cleaned up the sole. It does cut. The problem with this tool is it doesn't hold a setting super long, but this is, this is more of, I break this out when I want to enjoy the process, just to play around, just to vary things up. It's, it's a toy. It's fun. That's all it is. Another plow plane. Now, I admit, I don't really use this one ever. I just like having old hand tools around because it just, it, you know, it's, it's a mindset kind of thing. It reminds me that there are other options rather than just breaking out a router and doing it. It's a pretty plane. I have used it. It works. It's tuned up. But because this is a fixed distance over here, there's very few occasions where this actually fits what I need to happen in a piece. So I don't really use it. Now you may notice I do have two sets of chisels. I have my Narex chisels and I have my Robert Sorby chisels. More often than not, and this is luxury, I will admit that up front, I'm using my Narex for chopping motions or kind of the beater chisels, if you will, even though I take good care of them, versus my Sorbys, which I'm using mostly as paring chisels, meaning I'm only using hand pressure on them. It's just a habit I've developed over the years. You don't need two sets of chisels. I just happened to buy these first and then I wanted to upgrade to something else. The quality is very similar. I think these Narex chisels are more than fine for what you need to do. I've really liked these Sorbies for the, I don't know, probably eight years I've had them. They're fine, but for the price difference, I don't know that you're getting that much more quality out of this. I do have these last two oddball chisels in my cabinet that I keep over there with my Sorbies. This one is a 1 8 chisel. I just really love, it's so dumb. I think this is a Sheffield? A Hale Brothers. I don't even know who that is, but this chisel served me well for a long, long time. And then this is another one that I refurbished. It's just longer. It has a lot of length to it. I use this as a paring chisel for things that I need to get deep into something for. This is a quarter inch. This is an eighth inch. They're just oddball chisels I keep around. And lastly, we come to the section of measuring and marking up here. I've got two different marking gauges. This one is kind of your classic wooden marking gauge. This is one I made while I was in school. It's just a simple marking gauge up here, just a single pin. Both of these are fine. Honestly, I don't use them very often. Far more often I'm using this slicing gauge from Veritas. This has been a workhorse for me for a number of years. The reason I like this tool instead of say the marking gauge is because it leaves a finer line first and foremost, but also it's easier to use across the grain than the pins are. And so I just end up using this for all of my marking when I need it to. And then last, but certainly not least, I love this guy. So this is a measuring stick, right? This is kind of a squaring stick as it's called in order to measure your box to make sure it's square. So essentially I can extend this from corner to corner on my box, lock that in place, check my other corner. And now I know that that box is square because it's the equidistant corner to corner. I love this for two reasons. Number one, it's just sexy. It's got this sliding dovetail in the back here. It's got this gnarled brass knob. I believe this is Coca Bolo, if I remember correctly. So it's just sexy. But number two, it was made by Adrian Ferrazzuti. Now, Adrian is one of my old teachers. He's become a good friend over the years. He is one of the people that I hold in high, high regard in the furniture world. If you don't know Adrian Ferrazzuti, 
Go Google him right now. You will not regret it. He's a brilliant maker. But he made a set of these a couple of times and I bought one. So it's just, I've used it. I do use it on occasion. But it's really just one of those things I bought to support somebody that I admire and that I consider a good friend. So, squaring stick. Now that's the interior of my cabinet. I do have some things hidden around the cabinet that I also consider in my collection of hand tools, also under the bench and in a different cabinet. So let's talk about some of those. So behind the right side of my cabinet, I keep a couple of things. I have my hand saw here. This is a cross cut saw from Distin, Spear and Jackson. Spear and Jackson. One of my favorite panel saws, a panel saw is Technically speaking, the length of saw that I want to say is between 20 and 24 inches, might be 22 and 24 inches. They were very specific back in the day. I really like that length. Anywhere in the 18 to 22 range is really what I prefer for a hand saw. Now I do also keep two Eastern style saws on here, two pole saws. I do use these on occasion. I don't prefer them for dovetails or joinery work. I just learned on a Western style push saw, so that's what my body knows. That's just a preference thing. If you like Eastern style saws, if you like pole saws, by all means, go with some pole saws. Now on the left side of my cabinet, I do keep a couple of other tools. A mini router plane. This one is from Lee Nielsen. This is really helpful in very specific situations where you just need to be able to get in there and flatten out, say, a tiny dado or get inside a really small component. Now this is another texturing tool. This is an old toothing plane. So if you could see the blade in here, this actually has a series of undulations ground into it. This tool was originally used for prepping a substrate before gluing veneer on with hide glue. The hide glue needs a little bit extra tooth to the substrate in order to glue properly. These days, and the way that I use it now, is mostly just as a texturing tool. It leaves an interesting scratchy texture. Sometimes it's a thing that I like to play with, so that's what this is. Lastly over here, my absolute favorite plane, no doubt. This is a Lee Nielsen 102. This is my favorite block plane, regardless of any of the accessories that I have on here. I think it fits in the hand really well. I think it's easy to use one-handed. You see me use this plane on every project I've ever made since I've had it, hands down. But also, my immensely talented and good, good friend, Jenny Bauer, engraved this for me. I mean, it was stunning beforehand, but it just brought it to a level of, oh my God, this is the best damn tool I own. And I just love it. This part of the reason I have it up here, because it's just, that's one of those things people should see in my background, you know? I've talked about before how I got a bunch of hand tools under my bench because backgrounds on YouTube versus functionality. This one, this one people should see. Yes, I do have one, one red tool. There's a reason it's behind my door. This was a gift from a former student, so I do hold it kind of dear to my heart, even though it's got that red on there. And yeah, I'm throwing away my chances as a sponsorship right now, right here, and you know what? I feel good about it. There are other variations that are cheaper. Now this, this is actually a good cautionary tale. So when I was a young woodworker, really, really early on, I'm talking like I had a job, I was just after college, and I wanted to spend my tax return money on woodworking tools so that I could start this process of figuring out how to do this professionally. This would have been 2008, 2009. Great time to graduate college, by the way. I took the entire budget over to Woodcraft. I walked in, I walked up to the guy at the counter and I said, what do I need to start woodworking? Now, I should have known, I should have known, but I was, I was a young buck. He had that kind of swagger. I'm sure he's a nice guy. I don't remember his name. I don't mean to disparage him. But he essentially went around and said, you need this, you need this, you need this, you need that, you need that, you need that. And they were all more expensive versions of what I actually needed. Some of the things I didn't need at all. This was one of those things. There are a couple of things that that gentleman sold me that I never used once because they weren't very good, including, and not limited to, Wood River Plains. Am I throwing away another sponsorship opportunity? Absolutely. Woodcraft does a lot of things really well. You know what's not one of them? Hand planes. They were trash. I got rid of it pretty soon afterward, but I've kept this just because it's easy. It's a square. Don't get suckered into buying things you don't need. Oh my word. Oh, I gotta go full hassle off for this one, huh? Okay, here we are. We're living this life. Now, under my bench, I keep a few things. I keep my three spoke shaves over here. You've seen me use these many a time. 
This old one from Stanley, which is brilliant. I love this. This is my hog. This is my workhorse. I tear through material with this one. This is my refinement spoke shave. This one is from Veritas. This is the only curved bottom spoke shave that I own. Now my hand tool lineup down here. I've got a wooden plane that I made while I was in school. This one I mostly use for edge jointing veneers. However, I do break it out on occasion for solid wood surfaces. I've got a low angle jack plane from Veritas. This is the only Veritas hand plane that I use regularly. I don't necessarily think that a low angle jack plane is a necessary tool in your arsenal. A lot of people would disagree with me. A lot of people think the 62 is the first plane a hand tool enthusiast or beginner should purchase. It is touted as being easy to manipulate around highly figured or difficult grains. I have not found that to be true. So consequently, when I am working with highly figured woods, I'll break out my five and a half, which I keep right here. This is maybe my go-to bench plane for any flat surface work. I think it's the right size, it's the right width, it's the right weight for me personally. I think it's just a brilliantly made plane and I love using it. I also keep a Stanley number five down here. I use this on occasion for kind of rougher work. The same way I keep kind of a, a rough spoke shave and a refinement spoke shave, I keep kind of a rough number five and a refined number five. You don't need more than one. It's just a luxury that I have from years of collecting tools. And then we come to the two number fours I have. These two in particular, I've got a four and a half and a number four. I use them regularly. They're some of my favorite planes. This number four in particular, I use on every single project. It is a brilliant plane, whether I'm using it for shaping an edge, jointing an edge, it, there's nothing it can't do. And I just, I bloody love the look of this plane. It just, with the sap wood in the handle, it's so sexy and sleek. I love that thing. Now I've got one last stash of hand tools to show you. Mm -hmm. This usually lives under my secondary bench, just a way to weight it down and a convenient place to store these tools. But what I have in here, I've got an old Stanley number three that I really enjoy using. Sometimes I will take this to the lumber yard to be able to remove some material and just take a quick look at the grain. An old record number four. So here's my third number four and my fourth number four is not even in this collection. It's in a different location. This is one of those tools I take to a job site with me. So I do keep it fresh, but if I need to go do an installation somewhere, this is the tool I'm gonna take. Nothing wrong with an old record. It's comfortable, it works, but it's not my favorite. So if this one gets a little bit dinged and dented on the road, I'm okay with it. I've got a fun little Stanley Bailey transition plane here. This is one I bought this past fall and I refurbished it. It works. It's beautiful. I just like having it around and the old Stanley number seven. So like I told you, you don't need a Lee Nielsen number eight. You don't even really need a seven nowadays, but if you're going to do a lot of hand tool work and you want to flatten things by hand, having a long bodied plane is definitely a necessity. I bought this very early on. It still works. It's great. The main reason I don't like it it's got a corrugated sole. I just, for whatever reason, I don't think it does what it was intended to do, which is decrease the drag on a piece of wood when you're dealing with a metal plane on a wooden piece. It's nice to still have around on occasion if I need a long beater tool. And also in this cabinet, I keep my roll of carving gouges. Now I do have a selection of carving gouges in here, mostly file and RU. Again, I love the RU carving tools. I love more or less all of the tools that RU makes. They're just difficult to get, unfortunately. There's nothing wrong with file as a carving tool. Don't let anybody tell you that you need some other brand. And then lastly, we have my dovetail saws. Now, I do keep three different styles of dovetail saw in here. Number one in my oldest dovetail saw is the Spear and Jackson D-grip handle. It's comfortable, it's great, it works really, really well. It's pretty deep for a dovetail saw. It's a good little tool I picked off of eBay some years ago. My second dovetail saw is this one from Veritas. This is the molded spine pistol grip style saw. It's comfortable, I like it. I think this hump is a little bit heavy in my opinion. It's not as deep as the Spear and Jackson. However, it cuts quite well. It's a little bit more aggressive at 14 TPI, but it is a really nice saw and it's not that expensive. And lastly, now this may be a controversial opinion. This is my favorite dovetail saw. This is a $20 crown gent saw. Now why it's called a gent saw, I don't know. Sometimes it's called a straight handle. I, you know, they were trying to sell this as like the gentleman saw, but 
This saw is brilliant. This is somewhere around 20 to 22 TPI, maybe even a little bit heavier than that. And for whatever reason, this is just me, this is not everybody, but for whatever reason, having this straight handle, when I'm pushing through the cut, I feel like I have more control over the angle of the cut. So when I'm cutting dovetails, I really only use this saw. So if you're looking for a really inexpensive option, this is my go-to. This doesn't mean it's gonna be the best for you, but this is my go-to dovetail saw. So friends, that's this week's video. I hope it was helpful. I hope it was interesting. These are tools that I've collected over probably the last 15 years, that may be a little generous, maybe the last 13 years or so, many of which I use regularly on every project, some of which I use in very specific applications that you may or may not need in your own practice. But I hope it was informative. I hope you see the array that you can collect over the years. Some old, some new, some have very specific niche purposes, and some are universally helpful in making anything out of wood, really. So if this is the type of video you want to see more of, right? Like if, if there's a tool in my cabinet that you want to see me do a deep dive into, say the plow plane or the router plane, I've been thinking about that. Drop a comment down below. Let me know that those are things that you want to see, that they'd be educational and helpful and not just immensely boring if you just want to see me do builds and projects. But I think this is all a part of that educational foundation that I want to build here on this platform. This is the type of information that I want to relay to you all so that you know that you can make things in whatever way that you please, whatever way that you have the ability to, financially, physically, whatever the case is. The goal is just to make objects and to have fun doing it. So get into the shop, go make a thing, go enjoy the process, and I will see y'all next week. Cheers.